We're going to tell people to celebrate. We're going to tell people to show, have, have showmanship and have fun. And we're going to make the games faster. Business of Architecture, episode 260. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, head on over to freearchitectgift.com to get instant access to my four-part architecture firm profit map video. Enter your best email address on that page and you will get instant access. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is an online firm management software that helps you manage everything from project billing to invoicing to time spent on projects. You can get a free trial over at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. SageGlass brings you tomorrow's technology today. They're the manufacturer of highly intelligent tintable glass that responds to the environment or you can even control it from an app on your phone. You can visit sageglass.com to see the future of the built environment for yourself and perhaps it's a fit for one of your upcoming projects. Today is the second half of my interview with Jesse Cole, the marketing genius who transformed the struggling minor league baseball team into a team that plays for sold out crowds all season long. I first was introduced to Jesse Cole by my friend Scott Beebe, who shared a presentation with me that Jesse had done on designing the client experience. What happens from the moment someone first interacts with the company all the way through doing business and then after that? And here's a question. Let me ask you something. So what if you gave the same attention to the experience your clients have working with your company, working with your firm, all the little interactions that take place that you do creating detailed and air-free drawings. What if you architected that entire client experience? What would that look like for your business? As architects, some of our biggest business breakthroughs can come by thinking and doing things differently than what everyone else is doing, thinking outside of the proverbial box. In today's interview with Jesse Cole, you'll discover where Jesse would start if he was designing a client experience for an architecture firm from scratch, and how to make it memorable so that people pass it on through word of mouth, how Jesse recognizes and hires top talent, including his simple but powerful future resume technique, which I thought was fascinating and I'm going to be implementing in my own business, how understanding the business you're really in can revolutionize your business. So discover that more, listen in. Without further ado, here's today's show. So say say you're an architect and I've I've talked to a number of uh, architects who are in one of my coaching programs, you know, and just listening with the way that their staff answers the phone and kind of the conversations that are happening there and there's a lot of room for improvement. Jesse, so let's just say that you were you were reborn with this enthusiasm and this desire to do something different, but you you were an architect, right? And you you loved architecture and like, okay, I'm gonna open an architecture firm. What would you look at doing differently for someone who's basically, you know, there's kind of two niches. Well, there's two kind of forms of architects that I kind of uh, that that listen to this show. I mean, there's plenty of things that architects can do. Uh, lots of different business models. I'm going to focus on two. One, you're kind of serving institutions, right? So you're doing higher uh, university work. You're doing hospital work. So you're working with committees, business to business. The other side is going to be business to consumer. You're working with homeowners, right? So either one of those, how would you start to look at uh, being different as an architect? I'll give you a great example. I, I recently gave a speech and there was a owner of a home builder in, in, in the meeting. He was listening. And I watched him at the end. He took notes the whole time. And he just sat there for 15 minutes deep in thought. So I went up to him. He goes, all right, we're going to do this. I go, what are you going to do? He goes, we're going to fans first our entire organization. I go, I'm excited to hear. And uh, Scott Beebe invited me back. And I know you know Scott invited me back. He goes, hey, Chris Dalzell from Shoreline Constructions, he's giving a presentation on how they fans first their business. This is two months later. And home builder, again, architect, doesn't matter what business it is. He said, after that, after that speech, he got a staff together and their spouses. They went out to dinner, had a private room, and they said, guys, let's map the journey for our customer from the beginning, the first time they call us to when they finally get the keys to their house. What would be the most outrageous, over-the-top, best experience? And they started throwing out crazy ideas like mariachi bands when they sign and fireworks, and then they scaled it down. And they said, all right, when they first sign, let's send them a video of all of us having fun, like a rap video, like throwing money around, signing. Then we're going to give them a gift of an iPad a Yeti cooler, a t-shirt. We're going to have a survey that has what their favorite snacks are, their favorite drinks, their favorite meals. 
Throughout, we're building the house. We're going to do drone footage and selfie videos showing the, pro the progress in their house. And he even shared an amazing story about um, someone, it was their anniversary and their house was just being built. He hired a limo, got a limo, picked them up at the airport, brought them to their house that was just barely framed and had a private dinner set up for them in their newly house as it was framed. The woman started crying. She lost it. It was an unbelievable feeling. And then at the end, when they're finished with their house, they have the red carpet, they have champagne toast. He joked how they forgot to make the champagne cold the first time, so they were drinking warm champagne. But it mapped this entire journey. And now what happened is they don't have to market anymore. All these people they've done this to, they tell everyone, if you're going to get a house, you need to go through shoreline construction. Now, is some of that over the top? A little bit. But it starts with the beginning. So like, for instance, you're talking at our, our company, our website, when you buy tickets, you start to work with us, you get an email that says, congrats, you just made the best decision of your day. Right now, we're running around the stadium, throwing our tickets up in the air, celebrating with Gatorade showers, and the tickets are now in our vault ready for you to go bananas. Just a fun first impression. So what happens when someone goes to an architect website and puts a contact us? Do they get a fun email back or something that stands out or is it a generic like everyone else? That's the first step. Then when do they get a call? What happens? You know, we make sure we call every single person and just thank them for tickets. Today, I was just doing that today, which an owner of the company, I love them more than anything. I call people and just thank them for getting tickets. You know, it's the details, you know, and I could keep going through this, but I mean, we have a director of first impressions in our office. When someone comes in, she gets up, shakes their hand, gives them a hug and offers them snacks and treats. What's that first impression when someone gets in touch with you, whether it's online, whether it's in a phone call or whether it's walking into your place. And she, her name's Kiki. She actually answers the phone and sings, Savannah Bananas, this is Kiki. And it's just fun. So, you know, and that's not professional, but I don't think anyone doesn't take it seriously because of it. I think they said, hey, this is part of their brand. You, you mentioned, you mentioned Kiki and in the book, you talk about how she came on and, and she was kind of introverted and, and you, you challenged her to, uh, to, I guess, uh, what was it? Sell some beer at one of the, one of the games? Yes. Yeah, it was, it was a wild thing. She was shy. and I could tell if there was something in her. And, and halfway through the season, I challenged her. I said, Kiki, I want you to sell beer tonight. She goes, sell beer? And I go, yes, I want you to get out. In the, but I want you to get animated. I go, beer here, get your beer here. And so literally halfway through the game, I walk around and I see this giant line outside this beer stand. And I see Kiki going, get tipsy with Kiki. And I was like, what? And it was the most beer we've ever sold, the most tips that ever made. And I was like, Kiki, what happened? She's like, I was just having fun. I go, do that all the time. And so the next day, she starts answering the phone. She starts having fun. And now, literally at 24 years old, she oversees our entire staff, our game day staff of 150 people, our interns, and she runs the training. And she's like, hey, guys, I was the shy introverted person. I'm, be I'm having fun. I'm going over the top. And uh, it's been amazing to watch her grow as a leader. Jesse, what have you found about getting the right team members, hiring the right people? Mm. I, think, I think a lot of times people need to look at you know, who they are, what they stand for, and what their beliefs are before trying just to fit a job description. I did a video on this the other day. I think often we, we don't think for people aligned with our values. We look for people that can fit that job, that specific job. We are all about our values and cultural fit. And we can teach people how to do certain things. So it starts in the beginning for us. We don't look for a, a resume, a, reg, a regular resume. We look for a future resume. So we actually want to see what they're looking to do in the future, which is really fun to watch because do they want to grow? Are they hungry? If they say they just want to be with us for two or three years and go on to do something bigger, that's okay because we don't want people that feel are content and complacent. Um, we do a video cover letter that we want them to see their personality. And finally, we ask for the fan's first essay on how they fit to our core beliefs. So we spend months hiring to find that right person. And I think it's so important to find that fit, the culture, the energy, the fun. Do they fit that? And, uh, you know, we have <laughs> our staff of 15 interviews every candidate. So literally, one candidate comes in, they get 15 interviews, which is crazy, but you're coming into our family. And I think that's one of the reasons we've been fortunate. We've had no voluntary turnover since we started in, in three years, which with millennials isn't normal. I think, I think they, uh, the statistic I saw the other day was they leave every 13 months for a new job, which is crazy. So that's how we do it. It's not best for everyone, but look at yourself. You know, what does your business stand for? What's your purpose? Who are you? What are you trying to do? Start there as opposed to we just need someone to answer phones. Tell me about this process of the future resume. <laughs> 
I don't know how this came about, but I just, I, I looked at all these former resumes. Like I took sports management classes. I worked as an intern for this team. I looked, they were all the same to me. And I was like, you know, our, our two final words of our fans first way is growing and hungry. And I was like, well, let's actually see how do they feel about growing and hungry? So I, I said, let's put this together and see what happens. And we hired a director of events this fall and hers was great. She talked about, she wants to be an international event director that's sought upon as the expert in putting on events and travel all around the world in about, I think, eight years or 10 years. I was like, that's awesome. I want to help you get there. And as a leader, how can you help people get to the next level? You need to know where they want to go. So it's been a really great uh, exercise we've done. And I think our staff's really loved it. That's fascinating. Um, you, you talk about busy is not a badge of honor. Tell me what you mean by that. You've mentioned that in the book. How many times do you uh, talk to someone and the first thing they say, oh, I've been so busy. I've been so busy. It's almost like someone's bragging. I, was, I thought the other day, if we could eliminate conversation about how busy you are and about the weather, we'd actually have real conversations every day because that's what's talked about. And I think people brag, oh, I've been so busy. Busy is so busy. busy. And then everyone says, well, that's a good thing. They go, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good thing. <laughs> about busy. You know, you're laughing because it happens. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I, I think uh, the most successful people that I've talked to and I've read about, they don't feel busy. They have more time in their days because they're more efficient. They're not running from thing to thing. You know, I love hearing about all these people that put uh, think weeks like, like Bill Gates. They put time in their schedule to think and white space, like just to give time to get away. You know, don't go from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to phone call to phone call. Because you, you don't, you're not giving your best self. When are you your best self? Not when you're bouncing around. So I try to focus. If I ever feel overly busy, I'll take a step away. I'll start eliminating things from my schedule so I have less. And that's when I can feel like I'm actually working on the business and accomplishing more. What, what productivity uh, hacks or things do you have in your life that you feel uh, keeps you going, that gives you that focus? Maybe it's a morning routine. I know you talk about that in the book. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a thinking time. Tell me about your personal kind of things you do, self-development to keep yourself on the cutting edge. Yeah, mornings was a game changer. And reading Hal Elrod's Miracle Morning, uh, that was amazing. But recently it's been, you know, the mornings I would always, I run every day and I read every morning. And that's, I listen to a podcast for personal development. But I'll tell you, the writing has been the game changer. And not just writing into a computer, not writing into my Evernote on my phone, actually writing into a journal. And I read the great book, Write It Down, Make It Happen. And it was a brilliant concept. I talked to Benjamin Hardy too, who wrote Willpower Doesn't Work. He goes, when you start writing down, things actually happen and you start realizing it and you clear your thoughts. So every morning I spend time and I write two or three pages, sometimes more in my journal. And I've done that for a year now. And if I could give one advice, just write a little bit. And at first you won't know what to write. That's okay. Write the fact that you don't know what to write, but it'll eventually come to you. Do you write at all? I do. Yeah, I do. But well, to be honest, I have, I have trouble, Jesse, uh, finding what to write, right? So I'm yeah. curious, what do you write? Oh, geez. I mean, right now I'm focusing so much on vision and uh, Vivid Vision, a great book by Cameron Harold. I'm focusing on reverse engineering where we want to go. Awesome. Um, but I wrote, uh, the other day I wrote our business obituary, which was very interesting. So I wrote, uh, when our business is over and what will people say? What are we known for? What changed? Um, so I did my personal obituary in my book, but I did the business obituary. Um, I write goals. I write vision for my family. I write dreams. You know, I, I just, I write big things because that, that excites me and it gives me enthusiasm and energy going in my day. Cause I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. What I just wrote and I'm fired up about it. I like that. That's brilliant. Um, Let's talk a little bit about team, but not just the team players, but actually the team, right? The baseball players, right? So Savannah Bananas, you talk about the fact when you brought in a choreographer and one of the guys was like, I'm not doing this, you know? And that's, that's one of the first things I heard when I, I thought about, Jesse, when I heard your story, because I thought, you know, these, you were a baseball player, you know, the culture of baseball, it's a very macho culture. I mean, you got the chewing tobacco, you got these guys have the swagger, you know, these are the last guys I would expect to see shaking their heinies out on the court or wearing underpants on the outside of their uniforms or throwing bananas around. Um, how did you get buy-in and get these, get these guys, baseball players excited about this? You know, it's funny, just, just a couple of weeks ago, we became the first team ever to wear kilts in a game. They actually played a game in kilts, which is a form of a dress, a skirt, and they played a game and we won in a walk off in the night, but that's beside the point. Um, convincing them to do all that, it, it starts with the onboarding. You know, I, I think this year was the best year we've ever done on it because we ask a lot of our players, not only are they dancing, they're handing out roses to little girls in the crowd, they're out at the gate, uh, 
getting on programs, taking pictures. They're in ridiculous music videos. We just did a dance video. Um, I want to dance with somebody, Whitney Houston, and they're all dancing like crazy. It started that first day. So what we did is we presented, had their walkers all personalized. We had extra shirts and swag, and we brought them in like, this is college summer baseball, but you're treated like someone much bigger. So we had their walkers set up with all goodie bags and treats and something like this. Then we actually gave a speech to the guys and said, hey guys, this is what it's about. And then we planned a lunch for them. We had a lunch in our stadium club, a top of the line lunch, all the players. And I shared stories about Russell Wilson and what he did with our fans when he played for us back in 2009. I shared stories about the first year in the bananas and what the players did. It wasn't about me, it was about the impact the players made. And I said, and then we gave them our fans first playbook. And this is actually a book and I can share it with you. It's an actual book about what we stand for, who we are, with stories, everything. It's our playbook. And we gave it to them and said, guys, you are part of our family. And we started that onboard experience. I said, guys, in about a few hours, there's going to be over 2,000 people coming to watch you practice. It's not a game. It's a practice. They go, no way. I go, guys, this is because of what we do and the impact. You're going to see a couple thousand people practice. At that point, they think we're crazy. And then all of a sudden, what I do is we open the gates at 5 o'clock for this fan fest. And we had almost 3,000 people this year for it. And the line started at 3 o'clock. And I said, guys, I took a few of them out at 3.30, 4 o'clock. I go, look what's happening right now. And you look at them, you're like, oh, wow. And I said, all right, guys, we're getting ready to greet them. And at 5.30, we go out, and there's thousands of people waiting to come watch them take batting practice. At that point, they're like, this is real. And then after that fan fest, which is amazing, this first year, we finished at 8 o'clock. We said, guys, we're shooting our first music video. The bananas are back, kind of like Backstreet's back, but the bananas are back. And we shot till midnight. And not one player wanted to go home because they were so into it because they knew they were part of something bigger than themselves. And I think that's the key. After that night, they were in. And they watched that music video come out the next day because we edited through the night, had it come out the next day, and it went viral. And they're like, this is something special. So we constantly talk about what we're trying to do, why we're doing it, and constantly recognize them. And now I think it's a very good system that they've got buy-in. But it starts with that first day. What's that first impression? What's that onboarding? And uh, that's what we focus so much with all of our staff. Jesse, have there been any unforeseen benefits from this fans first experience that you've had? For instance, you talk about winning some games in kilts. I wonder if there's maybe some psychological intimidation that happens, you know, from the other, the other team where they feel a little smaller because you guys have such big personalities or maybe your recruiting is a lot easier now because people want to be part of this huge thing. Tell me, what are some of those things you've seen? 100%. 100%. We had over a 1,000 players reach out to us to play for us last year for a third. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, but not only just that, um, I believe this so more than anything. When you focus on the right things, everything else takes care of itself. We focus on the atmosphere, the culture, the environment, and making sure this stadium is packed every night. And when they're playing in front of 4,000 people every night that are into it, that are wearing banana costumes, that are having signs. We have a guy that shaped his beard like a banana. He's called the banana beard. I mean, fanatics. When you create that, the players just come out and play well. They take care of itself. I mean, we have a breakdancing first base coach who's doing the moonwalk and doing crazy MC Hammer dances in the middle of the game. Yeah, the other team is like, what is going on? They're looking around like, is this for real? I mean, we, we, the other day we came up, we have Barney go to home plate during the umpire meeting and Barney, we play the Barney song. He's literally hugging them and hugging the other coach saying, I love you. You love me. People have no clue what's going to happen in our games. And I think that does obviously create a great advantage. And most teams focus on the wins and losses in the baseball. We focus on everything else. And the first three years, we won the championship our first year. We had the best home record in the league our second year. And right now we have the best record in the league our third year. Focus on the right things everything else takes care of itself. That's impressive. So the playbook you talk about, is this something that would normally be a company a company uh, standards manual in another organization? Yeah, it, yeah it, it, I guess it would be the operation manual for another business, but we keep it. It's all pictures, quotes, colorful. Our staff actually wrote it together. So everyone had their own quotes, what fans first means to them, what the stories are. And we share it with everybody. You know, We share it with our staff, our game day staff, you know, vendors that we work with and our players. So yeah, it's been kind of one of our big things. I hate manuals. I hate policies. We don't have policies. You know, just do the right thing. What's fans first? Take care of people. Um, and, you know, we come to those bridges when we get there. So you're, you're, I can tell you're a very mission-driven organization. You have a fantastic... Um, I don't know whether you call it a, a mission statement or core values, you know, sort of the fans first entertain always sort of these, uh, you know, the yardstick by which you measure yourself. And 
you know, Scott Beebe introduced us. So he focuses on helping businesses do that. Um, you distill it very well in your book. You have a very good example and talk about mission and values. Tell me, summarize for me your personal opinion about creating culture, about mission, about values. What is that? Why is it important to a business? Mm. <sighs> mission statements frustrate me so much because the reality is a company comes up with a mission statement and most people in the company don't even know what it is. It's on a wall somewhere. And you search mission statements for some of the biggest companies in the world. And it's this long paragraph that says integrity and discipline and all these other words that really don't mean anything. And I think the biggest thing is how can you simplify something that if someone comes and works for you for one day, they understand what matters most. And that's why we simplified everything. Our name of our company is Fans First Entertainment. Fans first, entertain always. And we just simply tell people fans first. And I ask them, well, what does that mean to you? They go, take care of the fans. I go, when? They go, always. You go, what does that mean? Someone drops garbage, uh, nachos. Do you take care of it? Yes. Do you walk over trash? It's just we try to simplify that. And it goes into our bigger picture, which, you know, we want to be the most fan centric company in the world and provide the best fan experience in the world. And it starts from this fans first guide, because we know if we do that, we'll make a huge difference and a huge impact in many people's lives. So it is big, but we simplify it very easily. Think about that person that starts with you one day. Can you simplify your mission that they understand it and they can share it with somebody else? You have an entire chapter in the book talking about simplification. You give the example of Apple, Steve Jobs, well, the design of the first iPhone, removing buttons, removing the unnecessary. And I feel that's so important to business success. Tell me about your thoughts about keeping things simple. <laughs> I think it's very hard to keep things simple. I mean, people want to make things more complex, but starting your website, I think the easiest thing to, to, to really look at a business, is your website easy to use? Is there a phone number easy to access? Like, we just have it simple. We make baseball fun with a picture of our players dancing or our fans having fun. Start there because that's your first thing that people see about you. Um, I, simplicity is everything. It's why Amazon's been so successful. Airbnb, you know, they're following all these things, the three clicks, all these different things. So um, I always ask our staff, I go, how do we make it simpler? How do we make it easier? You know, when we send out a package to someone, how do we make it less steps? You eliminate those friction points. So we're constantly working on that. And I think with simplification is also design. How do you design with architect? How do you design it to be simple so someone can understand it? I mean, you have these elaborate drawings, but can a regular person understand it very easily and simply? And I think that's, that's the key to be able to get your message going to the next step. That's awesome. You, you asked the question in your book, what business are you really in? What do you mean by that? And how does it apply to the Savannah Bananas? <laughs> you know, I, I love that because everyone says you guys are in the baseball business. <laughs> nope, we are not in the baseball business. The amount of time and energy I spend talking about baseball is probably less than a half percent of half percent of half percent. Um, we are 100% in the entertainment and the experience business. That's what we talk about. And, you know, I, I would challenge, I believe everybody is in the entertainment and experience business to a degree. Um, everybody wants to be entertained, even a professional company. Entertain is just a way to make people feel good and feel like they're excited about something. And the experience is everything. So uh, I challenge people to question, really, what business are they really in? And if you can narrow that down and answer that and make sure you're focusing your time on that and not the other things, you'll be more successful. That's a bomb. <laughs> you just <laughs> dropped a bomb on us. <laughs> So fantastic. What, what I'd like to know here as we finish up, Jesse, is what, what truly what are the challenges that you're facing right now? What is, you know, sort of those unfigured out puzzle pieces that you're trying to unlock right now in your business? Once it gets easy, you need to work harder. And once it gets easier, you need to work harder. For us, you know, where we are at the level, we are on top of the game. We're very fortunate. We sold out every single game. We have a wait list in the thousands. When Netflix was on top of their game, what did they do? They stopped sending out DVDs and went directly to streaming. And what happened to Netflix? Man, they went down pretty quickly, but they knew what was best for the future. We're going to have to make some big changes soon. And I believe we need to change the game of baseball. I believe there's still issues with it. And we're going to make some changes that are going to probably scare some people. But that's going to be a challenge. How do we take the next step? Because once you get to a point where you're here, you get complacent. And I'm very, very scared about getting complacent, selling out every game and just being okay with that. We need to take it to the next level, which is how do we impact more people? How do we make a bigger difference in people's lives? So my challenge is how to get ready to do that. Um, hopefully don't go bankrupt again and hopefully not have to live on an airbed again. But I would guess in the next two years, I'm planning right now, we're going to make a big jump and do something that people probably have never seen before in the sport of baseball. And uh, I hope we hang on to it. 
Can you give us a sneak peek of some of the changes that we'll be seeing coming down the pipes? Again, goes back to the mirror moment and what's, what's, uh, what's the challenge with baseball. No matter how many promotions we have, no matter how many on-field skits, no matter how many characters we have, the game of baseball is still too slow. Our games are going over three hours. Right now, you can't buy a ticket from us. Every game sold out, yet people are leaving the games early. That's a problem. If people are leaving in the sixth or seventh inning, and when we walk off win in the ninth inning wearing kilts, and there's only 500 people to see that, and when we had over 4,000 there, we need to make the game faster and more exciting and more about the show. Baseball is so much about you got to do act like you've done it before. You hit a home run. You can't get excited. You can't throw your bat. You can't show that celebration. People thrive off that. And baseball is telling them they can't do it, and they're okay with these three-hour games because they're making enough money. We're going to change all that. We're going to tell people to celebrate. We're going to tell people to show, have, have showmanship and have fun. And we're going to make the games faster. That's a good little <laughs> teaser. Thanks, Jesse. Well, Jesse, thanks for sharing your experience with us here on the Business of Architecture. Uh, it's outside of our industry, but I love bringing in other examples. Hopefully, our listeners have gotten some amazing ideas about how they can really follow your example, the, what you've paved, and take their businesses to the next level. Thank you so much for having me. Seriously, love what you're doing and taking a chance and having a crazy guy in a yellow tuxedo on your show. And that's a wrap. To discover how to create a firm with less fires and more fun, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. That's one word. On that page, you'll be able to register for a free online training on how to grow your firm without being chained to your desk, how to take the next step from being a sole practitioner with perhaps two to three employees to really growing a business, growing your revenues, bringing on new team members that are able to get the work done at a very, very high level of quality that gives you the kind of lifestyle that you want and allows you the freedom to design incredible projects. Now, on the other hand, if, if marketing and finding new projects is where you're looking for help, you go discover how to market your firm to win better projects by signing up for my next free design firm marketing training by going to architectwebinar.com. That's a free online educational webinar. You'll get uh, continuing education credits for that. It's about 60 minutes, and I'm going to teach you the basics and the fundamentals on that training about how to market your firm for better projects. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. A huge thank you to both of those companies. BQE Core is the all-in-one firm management software. You can manage your finances, your company, metrics online uh, through a beautiful UI to create a profitable and impactful firm. You can get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. And of course, Sage Glass is the manufacturer of highly intelligent dynamic glass that tints it can you can control it from an app on your phone you can set it up to respond to different environmental criteria it's pretty amazing stuff and the future is here so sage glass gives you the freedom to design beautiful buildings and be unconstrained by the sun visit sageglass.com to see the future of the built environment for yourself and as always remember the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, pledge, warranty, guarantee, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.